Hi everyone, I'm Peter Cowan, Director of Conservation Science at the Peninsula Open Space Trust, also known as POST. For those of you less familiar with our work, since our founding in 1977, POST has helped protect almost 8,000 acres in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz counties. Our primary focus is on expanding and improving public access, as well as protecting our local wildlife, redwood forests, and farmland. Of course, this is all thanks to our wonderful donors, many of whom have joined us today. Thank you. POST works to protect wildlife big, small, through our work on a complex matrix of ecosystems here on the peninsula. Here, you can see the connections of how wildlife, both big and small, move across uh, and into the peninsula area. So we're pleased to be thinking, uh, pleased to be hosting Obi Kaufman, who is speaking to us about some of the smallest and most interesting forms of local wildlife, California native bees. Obi is the author of the popular and epic California bestsellers, The California Field Atlas, which is my go-to gift, and The State of Water. These are each filled with science, history, poetry, and stunning art. Obi has collaborated with Post on several projects, including our Post Bandana, a watershed map of the peninsula, our illustrated bird guide, and most recently, Obi contributed a blog post about the importance of California native bees. So I'd like to welcome Obi Kaufman. Hi, Obi, how are you? I'm good, Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing well. What have you been doing to stay uh, sort of balanced and sane during the shelter in place? Uh, not much. No, I'm not, sure. <laughs> um, not much sanity happening. No, uh, there's plenty of sanity happening. It's all happening back in my garden. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just spending my days uh, cleaning up after an, uh, just an epi epically fecund uh uh, season back there everything is 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 overgrown flowering and dense uh and uh you know any day and what i'll be talking about today any any yeah. any day in any given hour i can count like you know dozens of species of bees but i got a hummingbird feeder and i got uh, and i got a bunch of bird feeders back there too so it's just it's just full it's just a just a highway of biodiversity the way i like it yeah that's fantastic so uh Besides, besides bees, what are, what have you been uh, sort of painting or drawing lately? Uh, well, I just finished uh, my next book. That'll be the next field atlas. It's called The Forests of California, and that'll be out in the fall, everywhere in the fall. So you'll have a new go-to gift. And thank oh. you for those kind words, by the yeah. way. Yeah, no, it's true, and uh, and I'll need a new one because everybody's gotten the field atlas. <laughs> <laughs> right on, excellent, excellent. Well, uh, uh, how about you, Peter? What are you doing? Well, uh, I'm at my parents' place, actually, here in Michigan, and this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because mm -hmm. my father is an entomologist, and I'm actually sitting in front of his insect collection. So you can see, uh, if I scoot this way, you can see um, just rows and rows of insect boxes. Uh, so we spent, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my youth uh, tromping around uh, helping collect insects with him, and... Uh, we also happen to keep bees, so um, we sort of have both the inter you know some experience with the introduced uh, honeybee as well as uh, the native bees around this part of the woods, uh, and it's just so fascinating to me because uh, here um, the bees are are diverse, but then you go someplace like California and it's just boom, it's so different. Um, so uh, yeah, it's true. true. It's yeah. true. That, that's so cool. Uh, yeah, entomology is so close. To my life. I wish I had the patience and the temperament to 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 be an entomologist. I mean, the field is so wide open. It's fascinating that the the amount that we don't know dwarfs actually what we do know, right? Absolutely. There's just uh, so much, so much to still be discovered. You know, we. Uh, we often, when we talk about the biodiversity of a place, we kind of stop when we get to insects because all we can do is throw out, um, you know, big numbers that are estimates of what's there. 
I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about those estimates. Today. And, and you're right. And you're right. Like, uh, you know, I, Edward Abbey is a, is a writer who I've been hugely influenced by over the years, uh, you know, especially, especially a desert solitaire. But uh, one of, one of his, one of my favorite quotes of his was that there's reality and then there's California. And what he was talking about specifically was was the variety and the density and the quantity and the quality of uh, our biodiversity inside of this floristic province. Which yeah, it's just really it's class. really stunning. Yeah, so, indeed. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, please please tell us about some bees. Okay. Well, should we get the, should we should we get rolling here? Yeah. Let's get the, let's pull up some the slides. Okay, yeah, I prepared a little slideshow today, trying to get my thoughts all together here. This is a this is a bit um, this is a bit outside what I regularly do. I mean, this this presentation is going to be wide ranging. Uh, uh, when I look for some base core or grounding truth in whatever ecological principle I'm discussing, I end up drawing big proverbial circles. So just to even say that this is about bees is a little bit limiting and a little bit misleading, perhaps. Uh, I suppose that's why I'm not actually a biologist. Uh, as we were discussing uh, entomology, most of my heroes are scientists. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, my vocation, my proclivity is, is, is not about pulling things apart and studying them, but actually stitching them together. It's a synthesis over analysis, if you will. If we were evolutionarily able to afford the luxury of being more entirely present with casual observation, perhaps as a honeybee sees the world at a rate at least five times faster than we humans are able to process optic input, what wonders would we see in every corner of the garden, every millimeter every living millimeter would be revealed as related to every other living parcel of time and space. To the bee, and perhaps the whole dearth of non-human plant and animal life, uh, the full color of the landscape, and we know that bees see in full color uh, although there is some debate about whether or not they can see the color red, uh, that's why our bugle-shaped plants, like the penstemons, uh, wildflowers that have uh, that are red in color, are not pollinated by our bee populations, but rather by the other pollinators, including humming hummingbirds. Uh, anyway, negotiations between forces that all hold each other in check is what. Uh, the overarching topic of today's talk is the mountain and the deer decide where the lion makes her territory and the alder works out with the river to determine where and how this year's flowers will grow. And then the bee decides where and how those seeds will disperse, how the plants actually reproduce. Uh, everyone here makes a difference. Everyone here is essential. And that's a good thing. Uh, for today's presentation to hold into your mind, not what we can learn about bees, there's plenty of that, but what we can learn from them. Okay, next slide there, Mark. So in California, as everywhere, as we push into the future, or rather the future speeds towards us, the need to familiarize ourselves with localized patterns, nature's deep systems is emerging as a democratic responsibility. The value of understanding biodiversity as one example, the importance of maintaining its complexity and defending habitat for it to remain locally robust has never been more acute. At the dawn of the Anthropocene, at the dangerous cusp of global cascades arising from the extinction of so many hub species, we are awakening to the story of citizen science as a tool for maintaining our human ecology as it is revealed to us as a product of the more than human world. 
In that spirit, here today, we explore the nature of bees across the California floristic province, specifically their history, their diversity, and their relationship to the European honeybee and their conservation. Uh, as the temperatures continue to creep upward and human development to, continues to shrink available habitat, the importance of succinctly communicating core ecological science to the populace becomes sharper. Identifying not only the bee itself, but why and how the diversity of bees is important. In fact, it's a dire inroad to not only protecting them, but protecting ourselves. Next slide there, Mark. So, of the thousands and thousands of insect types in the biosphere, we see ourselves most in bees. Through their industry and purpose, society and systems of communication, along with how being covered in pollen collecting hairs, we are vaguely reminded of our own mammalian nature. We intuitively, intuitively relate to them. Uh, the world of mammals follows in both scope and range the history of bees throughout the Cenozoic era. Tens of millions Tens of millions of years before then, in a particularly bizarre and yet keenly important twist in the story that is the evolution long before the age of mammals, certain populations of wasps became vegetarian, finding similar nutrients in flower nectar that other wasp species continue to exploit through predation. Uh, and then, you know, it may be along some isolated populations, larvae in the wasps' nests began to develop a taste for the pollen offered instead of the meat itself. Uh, the basic nutritive components are available in both meat and pollen uh, uh, to carry a wasp larva through to becoming a mature wasp. Uh, wasps, bees, and ants are all in the order Hymenoptera. Uh, Bees are specialized vegetarian wasps who collect pollen instead of playing the role of predators in their ecosystems as true wasps do. If not for this little evolutionary innovation, it's conceivable that mammals would never have proliferated as they now do. We live, we live in a world designed by bees. Pollinators and the co-evolution of their flowering food sources and our existence might actually be tied to theirs. Next slide, please, Mark. What do we got here? We've got, we've got a map I did for post a couple of years ago of the watersheds and water courses of the Southern San Francisco Peninsula. If you can see in, uh, towards the left side of the map up, up, up Top there is the San Francisco Bay, lightly outlined, and 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 that little thumb that sticks out there is the city of San Francisco. The Santa Cruz Mountains extend from what we've got. Uh, we've got like I guess Pacifica is is the is the northernmost stretch of it. Although the Santa Cruz Mountains itself are a little bit south of that, all the way over to the Santa Clara Valley. Uh, and this is the topic of. Our discussion today, as it is a piece with inside the larger California floristic province. California floristic province itself extends past the borders of California, as demonstrated in the little orange map to the top there. Uh, it goes up into Oregon and then also includes the entire Baja Peninsula. So a, Cal a, a floristic province, and there's 13 or 14 of them across the North American continent are uh, designations of, of, of biodiversity across a floral and faunal plant and animal uh, portfolio. And, a, and we have the world classes we are discussing in our introduction. We have world class uh, biodiversity here in California uh, within uh, you know the top two dozen as far as as, 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 as as quantity goes. And that has to do with the way that California is basically an island unto itself, defined by uh, North America's longest, most contiguous mountain range, the Sierra Nevada, which is about 400 miles from tip to tip there, that has uh, created this island of evolution, of speciation over the past six million years or so since California has uh, 
sort of resembled its current tectonic configuration. In California, 85 to 95% of native flowering plant species depend on bees for pollination. That's almost all of them. Uh, some native bees are oligolectic, oligolectic, oligolectic. That's a fun word, oligolectic. Okay, that means that they are very picky eaters. Uh, so much so that they co-evolved with some endemic flowers. Endemic means that they're, they're only, they only exist in one little place inside the larger floristic province. They've co-evolved with some endemic flowers to be not only their pollinators and vice versa, the bees will only pollinate these flowers. Of the 4,000 bee species found in, in, uh, in North America, nearly half are found west of the Sierra Nevada mountains, about 16, 1,700 species of bees. It's not just honeybees, folks. That's, that's, that's a good takeaway from today's presentation. In the Santa Cruz Mountains, with its mix of climate and vegetation types, you know, climate very hot and dry, and then, and, you know, typically Mediterranean, then you got these cool wetter winters, you got a defined rainy season. It's a perfect place to get to know bees. Uh, there are no honeybees here, which is which is fascinating. No native honeybees. Of course, we've got we've got the the uh, the European honeybee, which is uh, which has been here for about four hundred years, which is probably the most common bee now because what it does very well and in the nature of its society. But our bees here are are mostly solitary, mostly ground dwelling, and they don't have the complex society uh, that, uh, that, that honeybees do. There once was a native honeybee, Apis nearctica, lived in Nevada about 14 million years ago before even the San Andreas Fault was a thing. Uh, but none since. Let's talk a little bit quickly about the role ecologically of the bees in California before we go to the next slide. Uh, the ecological role they play as pollinators being native bees, right? The importance of native bees uh, being two to three times more effective at pollination than the European honeybee. And this has to do with, uh, among other things, their, um, their, their, what, what a, what a, what a geneticist might call their, 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 their phenotypic manifestations, meaning what their body actually looks like, like where, where honeybees will carry their pollen on, on the back legs, native bees, including like the, the, uh, Bob, the blue orchard bee, uh, uh, has hairs all over their belly and they, and they're known for like belly flopping into these na native flowers and just being covered with the pollen. So they, they, um, so, but that's only, that's only one way in which that the, the native bees are so much more effective at pollinating, uh, uh, pollinating um, flowers than, than, than their uh, European interlopers. Uh, for the past, uh, ch -ch -ch hey, Mark, let's switch the side. Let's go to the next one. Let's talk about, let's talk about the human wildland interface for a moment or specifically how good science and good policy and political will can work together to form these um these new ideas about our responsibility our responsibility and our stewardship towards the land and towards uh the the living mechanisms that contribute to its functionality and thus to ours my friends uh, I work with different land trusts all over the state uh, in the past 20 or 30 years. Really, since the land trust movement took off, I would argue that it's probably the most effective grassroots arm of the environmental movement at all. Uh, we are now experiencing uh, this, this land trust movement. There are hundreds of land trusts across the state. And Peninsula Open Space Trust is one very effective one. Uh, it's grassroots, it's cellular, it's bottom up. We've got hundreds of land trusts uh, protecting hundreds of thousands of acres. And the movement is growing largely because there's no political story being told. I'm not going to get into that right now. The confluence of good science and good policy that generated a good strategy and coalesced into a story that fueled a community-driven grassroots ever effort down to uh, not waste not waste the preciousness that has been given. 
the preciousness of our natural world. Let's move on to the next one. Let's get back to the let's get back to the bees. Okay, let's let's talk about uh, pollinators. A pollinator is any animal, any animal agent that aids in the reproductive process of a flowering plant. Known uh, a flowering plant known by taxonomists as an angiosperm, uh, which is actually relatively recent evolutionary strategy in the long. Uh, multi-billion year evolution of plants themselves. Pollinators move pollen and thereby the male gametes in the flower from the anther to the female stigma where the ovules of, ovules of the plant are fertilized. It makes seeds happen. The only way that seeds happen is by actually physically moving the pollen to the stigma. So, so what be what <laughs> what angiosperms have done is they have outsourced sex. Uh, pollinators move from flower to flower, distributing genetic information vital to angiosperm reproduction. But it's not just bees, of course. I mean, pollinators. You're also talking. You're talking about lizards, dragonflies, bats, mantids, frogs, toads, spiders, songbirds, other bees. I mean, there's there's so many different kinds of uh, animals that flowers have so smartly employed i mean isn't that it i mean is it isn't there some intelligence there isn't there i mean there there certainly is with all of the diversity there is an argument for for some sort of strategy that is playing out and by intelligence i mean intelligence i mean on a genetic level that that uh that is responding um Re responding to to maybe what be uh, like ontolo ontological the way that things know things at all uh perhaps semiotics the way signs are read like uh, are, is that just the province of of humanity or is it in the more than human natural world uh angiosperm angiosperms flowering plants are a botanical evolutionary strategy that emerged in the biosphere about 125 million years ago. Uh, magnolia flowers are emblematic of what a primitive, primitive flower might have looked like, a landing, pla landing pad for a whole array of pollinating insects and a great place for the archaic wasps to grab a meal, right? Because they were the predators. But then about 100 million years ago, 100 million years ago, we find the first true bee fossils. And by about 60, 60 million years ago, bee species and flowers had evolved and, and um, had evolved around the world to great diversity. Uh, this strategy led to our present day taxonomical distribution of plants to be about 80% angiosperms. So we got about 900,000 species of you know, terrestrial plants on the planet and about 80% of them rely on some form of animal pollination. And that's, that's, that's a generalized definition of what an angiosperm is. Now, just, to, just, to con just, to, just so you guys can keep this in your head, an angiosperm is probably most, um, most uh, is best, is best um, thought of in, in, as, as something different than like a conifer, which is a gymnosperm, right? So you'll see in this slide right here, underneath the, the some of the, our local butterfly species, you got some pine cones, right? That, so that's what I'm talking about, the, the conifers. So we got the cypresses and the firs and the spruces. And of course, the star of the Santa Cruz Mountains, the coastal redwood. Uh, let's go to the next slide there, Mark. Okay, so this this is a fun, this is a fun bit of statistics. We don't have to go through all of these, um, all of these numbers up up here in the in the in the upper left. But this is what Peter and I were talking about before: the wide open and complex world of entomology, which is the study of insects. Uh, the importance of the diversity is actually knowing how diverse the bee portfolio is in the California floristic province and across the Santa Cruz mountains is more important, I would say, than actually being able to identify any one sp particular species. Uh, 
we've got uh, <clears throat> local bees range in size from the size of a quarter to the size of the individual letters on the quarter. I love that that idea. Um, you know, a quarter, a little, a little, a little, you know, twenty five cents there, a twenty five cent piece to the individual letters on the quarter. I mean, with just just to a, a millimeter or two in length. For most people, B identification is, let's just say it, a fool's errand. You know, uh, the, the best B identification guides include a few, as many as seven different diagrams to describe both sexes and species. In fact, let's go to the next one here, Mark, to make this larger point. I like this. Uh, so, so this is this is this is when you think of one of our one of our favorite little yellow-headed. You know the yellowhead bumblebee, one of our 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 great local heavyweights. This is one of the bigger of our native bees. You can see that all of these are the same species. We've got the the queens, which are much larger. Bumblebees, bumblebees, as I was saying before, are much different. They have a much different society than honeybees. A a queen bumblebee can live without her hive. Um. Or, or can live without her her workers and her helpers. And then we've got the workers, which are all female. Most bees that you see are female. That's that interesting point of fact. Um, males are, uh, you know, can can number, uh, uh, can you know, can be one to a thousand, one to ten thousand, depending on the species, uh, about how often a male happens. <laughs> a male is created. Uh, uh, it's it's much rarer to see males, um, although that's less so in the bumble in the bumblebee's case. But anyway, to identify a bee, to get to that rarefied point where you can actually pinpoint the species, for a mel melatologist, and I and I like that word too. So we got entomologists, we got melatologists. Um, that's a bee scientist. Meli is is Greek for honey. Uh, for a melatologist, uh, you, you know, you might, you might to identify, to best identify a bee, you might want to scoop it up with a, with a bee catching net and then cool it down in, in a cooler, uh, in order to slow it down enough where you can actually take a magnifying glass to it. Uh, but the best most amateurs can do is to understand the relative size of bees as they are classified by genus. And that starts with you know, understanding which tiny little insect flying around your garden is not a bee. So let's go on to the next slide there, Mark. So let's talk about what is not a bee before we can talk about even what a bee is, right? A fly is not a bee. You can tell the difference between a fly and a bee in a number of ways. Bees have collecting hairs, right? And they have long antenna, and that's their sm that's their smell organ, uh, which they're uh, th that that flies do not necessarily have. Uh, fly eyes tend to be bigger, and they tend to be mounted up on top of their head, where bees have uh, mostly side angled eyes. Uh, bees have bigger waists than flies, interestingly enough, between their thorax and their abdomen. Uh, bees have four wings. Uh, flies only have two wings. You'd think that would be a uh, a good way to like tell the difference between a bee and a fly. Actually, it's 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 it remains hard to do because most bees can actually hook their uh, their aft wings to their fore wings, and it looks like they have two wings in flight, and uh, and so the, you know that's just obfuscating as well. Uh, you know, a wasp is not a bee, but, you know, as I said before, technically, taxonomically, a bee is a vegetarian wasp. Uh, wasps often have silver faces uh, that bees don't. And the way that I identify what a bee and a wasp is, is, is by the look of the body. The wasp looks like, it just looks like a predator. Does that make sense? Maybe it does. I think it does. It behaves differently. It 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 has it has a law. It has a has a has a has a deadlier shape, if you will. Uh, okay, so 
you'll see you'll see some Latin on this page. You know, there are about there are only about forty species of bees with common names. You know, I mean, so uh, thousands of bees, and they've all got the Latin names. Um, don't be afraid of the Latin. Mm, you know, I I mean, just I, I, I guess I guess I'm just going on here about how about how. Uh, uh, difficult it is to actually identify bees um, because even even like morphology like even the shape the size and the look of the bee does not necessarily help you in identifying the bee you know the uh, bee scientists will often uh, determine bee species uh, by their face and by the vein structure with in the bee wings itself. So this is just to give you um, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a quick lesson in, in how difficult it can be and how you should forgive yourself, right? Well, there, there, are, there are other, there are ways to um, funnel the, all of this information down. And one of those ways is that there are only six families of bees, okay? So there are, um, there are uh, Andrenidae, and uh, there are Apidae, uh, Megachilidae, Calidae, Halictidae, and Melitidae. And of those, of those six, only five you're ever going to really see. And of those five, the biggest one is uh, Apidae, Apidae, Apidae. And these are the really common big bees, right? So uh, that includes all of the European honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, cuckoo bees, digger bees, carpenter bees, orchid bees, and bumblebees. So that is, you would think like there's more bees than that. There sure are. There sure are. What do we got here? We got the longhorn bee, bees. Those are the... Um, uh, uh, the longhorn bees. We got the we got the well. We got the mining bees and the mason bees here. Um, so the mega chilla day is good. Let's go on to the next one here, Mark. Uh, these bees include uh, the mason and the wool carter bees. Uh, mason bees because they actually dig their uh, nests in the ground. Some can go up to uh, uh, what eighteen inches deep, which is uh, which is the equivalent of like. A human digging a hole seventy-five feet deep. When you think of when you think of how uh, when you think of uh, how industrious their effort is. Uh, in the um, you know there's when we're talking about native bees, we're we're talking not only about um, bees that you find in wild, but you, but across the California floristic province, we've got many managed pollinators that are not just the European honeybee. I mean, we've got the alfalfa leaf cutting bees, which are in the family of the uh, uh, megachile. And we've, we've got the orchard bees, which are the, um, the osmia bees, which, which, which are related to, uh, well, let, let's see here. The, the, the blue orchard bees would be the, um, Osmia lignaria, and those are related to the wool carter bees. Um, I'm just thinking about how to transition now uh, from a discussion of our wild bees to how we as humans interact with them on an agricultural industrial level. Uh, orchard bees, orchard bees are a good place to think about that as, as we're beginning to think about how effective they are in pollinating, like I said before. Orchard bees are an order of magnitude actually more effective as pollinators as honeybees are because they carry their abdomens, as I was saying before, on their, uh, they carry the pollen on their abdomens as opposed to on their legs. And as they visit the flowers, the abdomen scrapes around, dumping pollen all over the place. And there's a lot of data that suggests that because of this behavior, that they don't they don't actually compete with honeybees 
especially in an orchard environment, uh, they actually make them much more efficient. So the the idea of bringing more wild pollination into our agricultural industry is one that is really uh, exciting, especially as we are thinking about resilient systems in our own local neighborhoods. Uh, let's see, oh, there's our friend, the yellow-faced bumblebee on this slide. Uh, you know, uh, bumblebees, as I was saying, now, you know, where you get European honeybees and you get nests of thousands and thousands of bees, bumblebees only live in nests of about, you know, 15 to maybe upwards of maximum about 100 bees. Uh, and they don't have permanent colonies. Um, bumblebees are very interesting because, and there's bumblebees all over the world. Humans love bumblebees because of one thing, is that they pollinate tomato plants. Honeybees can't pollinate tomato plants, which is, which is an interesting which is interesting to think that different bees pollinate different plants in different ways. Bumblebees do something called buzz pollination, where they wrap their whole mouths around, um, around the male part of the flower inside and shake in a very particular way that sends the pollen directly down into the female part of the flower. Um, honeybees can't do that. But because of this, and I'll get to this a little bit more in, in the, when, when I talk about the conservation of bees. Because of this, we've got a, uh, we've got particularly one species of bumblebee, local species called uh, Franklin's honeybee up, up on the border of Oregon and California, you know, up north. It's, a, it's probably the, the bee with the smallest di distribution in North America that might have gone extinct already because of uh, population contamination and, and what i mean by that is that is that its genetics have been spread out over the entire um the the, the entire uh, uh portfolio of cultivated bumblebee genetics and therefore its distinctiveness has been lost and that is unfortunate uh, but there's even a more unfortunate uh aspect to that which i will talk about as far as our reaction to that. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next the next one there, Mark. Um, native bee populations are facing worse, facing more threats than ever. Climate change is a big one. When temperatures are higher, bumblebee diversity is lower. Bumblebee diversity and native native bee diversity is lower. Uh, factors such as pollution and urban expansion also harm bees and plant populations. Uh, rising temperatures may, may be the main reason for the flight of bumblebees from central coastal fields. Uh, in addition to all of the stresses that, that, uh, that uh, bees face, uh, there are the mounting ones. And I've found a great list here that include hive beetles, Wax moths, fowl brood, chalk brood, stone brood, nosema fungus, Israel, Israel, Israeli acute paralysis virus, deformed wing virus, about 20 other viruses, tracheal mites, varroa destructor, another mite, uh, colony collapse disorder, poor diet, pestis and, um, pesticides on the flowers that we ask them to pollinate. So there are so many threats and stressors to bee ecology in our immediate area here uh, along the Santa Cruz Mountains and beyond. Uh, but when we're talking about bee conservation, we're talking about a number of things. And as in all ecological systems, the truth is very nuanced. Uh, there is honeybee conservation, and then there is wild bee conservation, and the two often have a hard time mixing, especially on a policy level. We've because of the importance of bees in general, and you've heard, you've I'm sure you've heard the st st statistics before of of bees uh, of how I mean bees are responsible for among other things six billion dollars of industry within the almond 
agricultural business itself. So just in almonds alone, we're talking $6 billion. Every single almond that you eat, the nut, and the nut of an almond is actually the seed, right? Every single almond you eat, a bee was responsible for making that happen. And in California alone, we, we make 80% of the world's almonds in the Central Valley. And uh, uh, nearly half, uh, or just over half, nearly two thirds of this country's uh, commercialized honeybee hives are brought to California specifically for the almond uh, bloom when the bees can do their work. And so we have got this, we've got this whole system, California's Managed Pollinator Protection Plan, that is this 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 dialogue uh, between policymakers and um, agriculturalists and beekeepers about uh, what policy should be going forward. That's very different than wild bee conservation. Wild bee conservation, I wish would overlap more. Like I was saying before, with the Franklin's bumblebee, that that bumblebee that is probably extinct in Southern Oregon. It's been under review as a potential endangered for for listing as an endangered species, but it has not been yet because well, a couple of things, right? It's it's not it's not necessarily a big money maker, and it is not, um, and so the political will might not be there, uh, and there's also not a lot of data. You know, I mean, we've got we've got pretty good data on the Franklin's bumblebee that it might be indeed extinct. Nobody's seen one in over ten years. So that that, that brings up two points, right? Then the nature of intrinsic value. I mean, the, the the idea of like listing the Franklin's bumblebee would have been a great one, for example, in the in the in the. Um, in the uh, you know the the old growth redwood wars when we all heard about the spotted owl right well the Franklin bumblebee could have shouldered some of that weight political weight garnered some more attention no it's not just the owls it's this whole ecosystem right down to the pollinators themselves the things that make plants happen but then of course there is the um, there is the data itself it is very hard like like okay so i've been going on and on about how difficult it is to identify species now let's try and get some real data sets going about conservation status of any of these populations it is so very difficult there are there are a few out there you know i naturalist is a good one everyone should become a member of i naturalist get to know your bees a little bit you go to Xerces.org. They've got a bumblebee project going on there. And I know there was a um, there was a big, the Great Sunflower Project right out of San Francisco State University, which is all about citizen science. It might be, ultimately, that one, we need uh, to mobilize an army of citizen scientists to get some real data about uh, bee numbers. And two, um, we're going to need to employ native and wild bees to assist with uh, pollination within the agricultural sector itself. There, there might be some utilitarian value. And of course, as we have seen in, um, you know, our dear, California economy, as in any late stage capitalist economy, I suppose, if pieces of nature have actual utilitarian value over intrinsic value, and we can demonstrate that, then conservation seems to be seems to kick itself in. Uh, I think that I will begin to wrap this up here as I say that we're dealing with vast complex systems of of ecology and resiliency across California's Santa Cruz mountains and beyond. Emergence from complexity. 
feather to wing to flight or seed to tree to forest or genotype to phenotype to even consciousness itself uh, may be the defining concept that will frame a coming ecological revolution, a bold and probably necessary trajectory for our species. How resilient systems, whether they are social, economic, political, physical, ecological, or biological, arise from diversity, connection, interdependence, and ad adaptation is an, inroading, is an inroad to understanding not only how we survive, but how we survive, well, well, how we survive what may be a future evolutionary bottleneck. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I see Peter there. I'm wrapping up with this final thought here because um, I'm going to leave you all after this presentation. I'm going to go back to my garden. And I wrote this yesterday. I'm sinking into a bed of flowers on this vernal afternoon after a sun so beautiful that I can't remember anything. Not my name, not my language. Maybe I'll just speak B from now on. Harmonize with the seed makers. Equate love with flowers. Watch the world as a chemical painting. Whatever I do next, I'll do it at the low frequencies, the hidden frequencies, the ones that mammals all too easily trample. I'll keep grinding this perfumed pollen and invent the me in love with my new friends that I've always wanted to become. Okay, my friends. Take care. Peter, how are uh, we doing? That was that was uh, just beautiful words and beautiful images. Thank you, Obi. Uh, Did that work for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's I can so tell much you more I could talk about. Uh, geez, you know, I mean, it, it, there's, there's no justice that can be done. You know, I didn't even get into what you can do with your own garden. My goodness, come on. There's so much to do. Absolutely. And, you know, I, reflecting on... Um, what post is doing and how we're trying to, you know, make a difference in our region and really resonated with your, your comments on the complexity of the systems and the interdependence of things and, uh, and how we work to, um, you know, try and protect land. But, oh, uh, but before I get so carried away, I want to, anyone who wants to a ask a question can, oh, yeah. can go ahead and do so in the live comments. And, uh, we'll have a few minutes at the end here and we'll try and, um, we'll try and get those. Uh, answered, but um, yeah, just absolutely wonderful stuff. And uh, thank you, Peter. You know, I I think that 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 point that you just brought up there uh, is 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 really important to to the nature of conservation science in general. Scientists don't have the luxury to actually deal with politics at all. That's not you know. I mean, you would think yeah. you would think in a democracy they absolutely would, but as core scientists. You don't get to. What you get to do is just get to present the facts, right? I, I'm an author. I'm an artist. I, I get to go, go places where, 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 of course, you can't as a human, but as a scientist, you can't go. Science can't prescribe anything. Um, you know, I think, that, I think that we listen to the science, but in order to derive meaning, we've got to... Um, approach a greater literacy, you know, and that, and that is where, that is where, that is where, uh, uh, gosh, it gets so slippery because it's so easily, easily, the rhetoric is so easily, easily turned into a divisive tool, uh, against this, this agenda that we've got, that is the intrinsic value of biodiversity itself. Yeah, I, and I'll reflect that one of the things that's really gr gratifying to me personally about working for Post is that I have the opportunity to take the science that's a, that's available and uh, really put that to work, trying to address some of these big issues. And bees are a great microcosm for the bigger issues of biodiversity that you were talking about, right? So um, things that we can do that will have benefits for bees, which you're totally right humans depend absolutely on bees uh and if we do good things for uh for bees that will benefit other species if we do good things for plant diversity that will benefit bees uh, right and so, so we're talking about like how like especially across post regions across the mountains here where we've got 
we've got different levels of intact native ecosystems, right? And so we're so we're talking about conserving those and restoring the others. Specifically, I know your specialty there, Peter, yeah. is is chaparral, but I'm thinking more of like like the the grasslands, right? Where 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 we've got the bevy of the flowers that come out, right? You know? And we've got and we've got this 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 balance between the bunch grasses that that allow for plenty of of bare ground, right? Which is which which needs to be incorporated into our into mm -hmm. our urban gardens as well, which is often like, oh gosh, I don't you know, garden aesthetics don't have bare earth. It's like, well, you know, most of our bees make their nests in bare earth, you know. So right. you need to you need to you need to keep some some of that there when you're designing your garden. But you know, across the greater habitat range, and that's what Post gives us, is that these, yeah. this great, and you can look at the, you can look at the map of what, uh, of, of, of Post's projects, and you almost see this, this corridor ecology happening uh, across, across the, the spine of uh, the ridge of this, that the Santa Cruz Mountains presents there. Absolutely, I, that's mm -hmm. purposeful strategy is to try and connect the different habitat blocks and to try and capture a diversity of habitat blocks, uh, ha habitat types, so that we're protecting those bees that, you know, bees love chaparral, but, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the, I love chaparral personally, but maybe not the nicest uh, place to go for a hike, uh, but, you know, absolutely great bee habitat. And yeah, for sure. Uh, in our farmland program, we work really hard to make sure that uh, the you know the farms that we're protecting on the San Mateo coast are surrounded by lots of native natural vegetation, either through wider riparian corridors or or you know in some cases hedgerow projects, mm -hmm. and, and those um, it's a win-win. It's great for our native bees. It gives them habitats, and then it also provides that pollination service to those crops. You know, you're talking about how much more effective some of the native uh, bees are. Right, right. Well, yeah, uh, in chaparral habitat specifically, you've got like the, uh, I'm thinking like the, 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 the Clarkia flowers that, you know, I, I was using that, you know, describing how finicky some of these, some of these native bees are. And you've got, you've got uh, Hesperopus regularis, which is one of our smallest native species that depends on these Clarkia flowers that only exist uh, in, in endemic species of particular kind of Clarkia flowers within right. those, uh, you know, uh, network there. So, so habitat, habitat, habitat. Since we're waiting on that data from all those citizen scientists, right? There's so, 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 right? Join post and become a citizen science scientist. How about those two things as an action item today for, for everybody listening? Right? Yeah. Do those two things. And, uh, and, and, Habitat, 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 whether or not it's your own backyard or it's in these larger open public spaces. Um, I, I want to ask just a few questions that people have submitted. And um, there, here's a great one. I wonder what the likelihood that the bees I'm seeing around my house are native or not. Very good. It's very, very probable, in fact. So in the Bay Area, we've got we've got upwards of about 100 species of bees that are that are that are that are doing well we think right um so the best way to do it is to, to take your time uh it doesn't take a um it takes a patient mind to be a uh to identify bees it doesn't you don't need to capture anything it just takes a patient mind slow down and watch even just watching one flower on one step watch who visits it and it might take a half an hour or so, but the chances that you will see at least one native, especially on a good bee day, you know, where the temperature is right, uh, um, uh, meaning warm and dry, you know, especially right now in late May. Oh, it's perfect bee, bee season, you know. Um, the other thing you can do is that uh, European honeybees, the kind we normally see, Really, really, kind of are finicky about when they go out. Uh, they, they, um, they might not go until later in the morning, and and they retreat to their hive earlier in the evening. Native bees tend to just need to get above a certain level of body temperature, and then they and then they take off. Um, and so, earlier in the morning or later in the evening, you're more likely to see a native bee as opposed to getting confused with the European honeybees, um, and that has to. And 
you know, I mean, it, and so it doesn't, so, so on a sunny day, the air temperature, so they might be able to get up to their flying temperature before even the air temperature does because of radiant solar heat. So uh, because they're, you know, uh, um, probably in their shallow little nest there underneath the ground before they come out every day. So that, that's a tip too, if you wanted to, uh, if you wonder at uh, whether or not this, you know, is what time of day it is. Right. That's great advice. And then um, just really quickly, can you maybe suggest some resources for people who want to attract bee, native bees to their garden? Where might they go find out more information uh, about how to plant that garden? Oh, that's a great idea. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, the, the uh, entity well, okay, that comes. So, yeah, here, here we, here we yeah. go. Here we go. The Urban Bee Project website. Yeah. Urban Bee Project website gives uh, tips for attracting native bees to your home garden. Uh, variety of native and non-native plants, just big lists of them that you can go down. I, I was at Home Depot the other day, and it's very hard to find native plants there. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, you know, I've got so many like Peruvian lilies in my backyard, and native bees just don't touch them at all. So I'm taking them all out. You know, like, and that has to do with like the red color too. You know, so uh, we're looking, we're thinking about like um, even like. Uh, uh, well, we got uh, Calliopsis, sunflower sage, coyote mint, gumweed. Like, there's a lot of different plants that look really good, and um, and that you can plant in your backyard. Yeah, and somebody posted a comment to look at Xerces. They're a great resource. Xerces. Totally. California Native Plant uh, Society has uh, lists of native plants for your region. A lot of information on the local gardens. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think we're uh, sort of at the end of the show here. Um, thank you, Obi, so much. Uh, that was just really wonderful. Where can people find out more about uh, what you have going on, and uh, how can they be sure that they get that uh, new book the second it becomes available? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I post a few times a week at uh, Coyote Thunder on Instagram. So that's just all one word, Coyote Thunder at Instagram. That's probably my favorite platform, social right. media wise, uh, even more so than like even Facebook or Twitter or any of the other ones. So mm -hmm. that that's a way to keep up with me daily. And then I post my long form essays at coyoteandthunder.com. Wonderful. Uh, and that that's a good you can also go to californiafieldatlas.com if you want to if you want to order a book directly from me but if you you are at, at any one of those three places you will get my you will get access to ordering be the first to order my uh next book the forests of california in which i go all over the state um, examining arboreal habitat specifically within the California floristic product. Wonderful. Uh, which is, you know, and that, and that book, that book's a, that, that's a weighty tome. That's coming in at like 650 pages. That's going to be about a hundred mm -hmm. pages bigger than even the California yeah. first that Atlas was. So, you know, there's more to talk about, you know, California is robust and, and enough, yeah. deep enough, beautiful enough for me to write a hundred field atlases. So I've got, I've got the rest of my life's work figured out. Great. Come join me, Peter. Let's go for a hike in the Santa Cruz mountains. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All right. Excellent. Uh, okay. I just want to give a special thank you to all those post supporters out there. Um, we couldn't do this work without you. Uh, so, a, you know, a very personal heartfelt thank you on that. And then um, just a, a quick plug on Friday, there's going to be another event featuring Chris Wilmers of the Santa Cruz Puma Project. Um, and I've seen Chris speak on a, a few occasions and it, it, he's just fantastic. So I really encourage you to um, find out the information uh, and learn more about our, our local Puma populations. Just mm. really cool stuff he's doing. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. All right. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for having me.